The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it, gain, for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? The Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in God's kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're glad you're here today for the first day of our new sermon series. Uh, this sermon series is called Let's Talk. And in this series, we're going to be addressing difficult subjects. And you might say, why start off the year? This is this new school year, sort of like starting off the year. Why start off the year with such heavy subjects? But we figure there's never a better time, there's never a good time to talk about these things. Maybe if we talk to them now, uh, it can be helpful to somebody in some way uh, in the days and weeks and months to come. And so, for instance, in two weeks... We're going to talk about suicide, and that obviously is a, is a very uh, heavy subject, a very weighty subject, um, but we feel it's absolutely essential to talk about this. You may know that last year in Loudoun County Schools, five young people committed suicide, and I can tell you from what I do that more kids tried. Uh, what you may not know is that in the general population, uh, even far more people than that committed suicide. And I was reminded of that on Saturday night when I looked out and saw one of our police officers in the congregation and, and thought how just recently one of the calls they had responding to was, a, was an absolutely grisly call uh, where somebody had uh, taken their own life. And, and I, again, I can just tell you um, that it's somewhere along, the li longs, it, somewhere along the line in your life, you are crossing paths with a person or more likely people who are at least thinking about suicide and some of them seriously slow. And we can actually do something about that. Uh, and so if, if we can have just a little bit of influence so that only four kids instead of five commit suicide, or better yet, no kids, if we can help one person who's struggling with suicide begin to come to grips uh, with that, then we figure it's worth taking 20 minutes on a Sunday morning to do that, right? So our hope is that you will be here yourself because, because again, we think we can do something about that. We think we, we think we can help everybody with that. And our hope is not only that you will be here, but we actually hope you'll ask all your friends to be here doesn't matter whether they believe in God or not. What really matters is if they believe in people or not. And if they believe in people and they want to be helpful, then they need to be here for what we have to say that Sunday morning. And, and I, I think this sermon is a lot like that one because we're going to talk about hate this morning, and hate's not a pleasant subject. We've been talking about this sermon at some length in our, in our home, and, and my wife jokingly said when we were talking about hate, she said, oh, I'm not coming to that. I mean, who, who wants to hear about that? And that was, and, and again, she was joking, but that was actually the response we sort of thought people might have and expected people to have. And, and so we're glad you're here because, because we think these are things that, 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 that people, that we hope people will not avoid, but that they will address. And if we can take the next 45 minutes and talk about hate, <laughs> if we can take the next 20 minutes <laughs> and talk about hate, if we can take the next 20 minutes and talk about hate, in such a way that even one person will make a choice just to be a little less hateful in the, in the, in, in the year to come. That's worth the next 20 minutes, isn't it? So, so thank you for being here for that. Let, let's dive in. We've got a lot to say. Uh, in today's gospel, uh, Jesus uh, actually addresses hate. He does it. it it's, it's in the background. It's covert, not overt. But, but much, of what's, much of the dynamics in this gospel, much of what they're circling around actually has to do uh, with hate. Uh, just last week, Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ. And Jesus said to Peter, uh, he said, Peter, you're right. You are the rock on which I'll build this church. 
And this week, Jesus says, I'm the Christ, as you said last week, and that means I need to go to Jerusalem, suffer greatly, be killed, and then after that, be resurrected. And Peter says, oh, no way, you can't do that, Jesus. And then Jesus, making a play on words, showing that he did, in fact, have a, a sense of humor, says, Peter, you know, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block. Last week, the stone on which this, uh, you build the church. This week, the stone that causes people to stumble. Uh, and, and, and the problem is, is, that, is, is what Peter wanted from Jesus. Uh, the problem was that the reason that Peter said, Jesus, you can't do this, it was, is what he wanted from Jesus. And what he wanted from Jesus was to provide a military solution or a political solution to the problem of their day. And so the problem as a Jew living in an occupied state was that they experienced Rome very much as a hate group. In, in every sense of the word. I mean, they were racially profiled. Uh, they were subject to racist, uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, of racial violence. Uh, they were subject to, I mean, Rome had raised violence to an art form, terror to an art form, and that's why they were, at least for a short term in history, were able to rule so effectively. Uh, they abused people, they raped people, they terror, I mean, you, know, you, know, you name it. So, and, and so Peter expects Jesus, through sheer military might, through sheer political violence, to eradicate Rome to remove Rome from the face of the earth and so usher in the kingdom of God. And it's, it's surprising to Peter that chooses, Jesus does not choose to do so. In fact, uh, what Jesus, uh, in fact, what Jesus says is um, not only is he, is he not gonna do that, but that we need to take up our own cross and follow him. And, and by that, what, what I take Jesus to be saying is that, is that Jesus didn't just come to bring us comfort. Taking up a cross isn't a comfortable thing. Comfort comes when we get more of what we already have. So if I have some power, I'm comforted if I think I can have more power. If I, if I have a, a voice, I'm comforted if I think I can get more, a, a, a louder voice in life. If I have some security, I'm comforted if I think I can be given more security. But what Jesus is saying is I haven't come to give you more of the same old things because the same old things haven't taken the human race to where they need to be. The pursuit of power, the, 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 um, the pursuit of power, the, the pursuit of security, the pursuit of comfort, they haven't taken us to where we wanna be. So what we need is we need something entirely new. So Jesus didn't come to bring comfort, Jesus came to bring release, Jesus came to be freedom, to bring freedom, to free us from the old, take up our cross, be dead to the old so that we can genuinely receive this new life, this new kind of life, and genuinely usher in a new future, a new world, a new form of humanity. That, that's what Jesus promised. That's what Jesus is talking about. Now, one of the people who really helped me understand this is a guy by the name of Stephen Covey. Some of you probably heard of Stephen Covey. He wrote The Seven Habits of the Highly Effective Person. I'm sorry, Aria. Um, and, uh, but he was also known for teaching on something called principle-centered leadership. And I was fortunate to attend a seminar he did on principle-centered leadership. Uh, there was an admiral from the Navy, two army generals, a couple other high-ranking military officers, a bunch of CEOs from global-level companies, uh, companies and, some, um, and some powerful political people there. One of them was at Howie in the Hills. I didn't even know there were hills in Florida, but that's where it was. And... Um, uh, one of the cool things about Stephen Covey is he'd draw, draw diverse people together, and uh, these folks treated me n nothing but well, and, and I learned quite a bit from being there. Stephen Covey talked about power and the use of power at this, and he said there's really three types of power. Uh, and the first type, he said, is what's called coercive power. Uh, so coercive power is exactly what it looks like. It's, it's using power to force somebody to do something. So, so the, the driving impulse behind coercive power, coercive leadership, is force. And that may sound bad, but everybody uses this somewhere along the line. So if you're a parent and you have a kid, a two-year-old kid who's about to run out into the road, do you reason with your child? Uh, do you appeal to his higher nature? Do you have, no, 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 you do whatever it takes. And the child has no say in it whatsoever, right? Uh, you grab him by the scruff and whatever you do, that kid's not running out in the road in front of a, in front of a Mack truck. In fact, I suggest we use that in other ways. I, I suggest we probably use that same sort of power when it comes to brushing our teeth. Uh, if, if my parents, hadn't used coercive power to make me brush my teeth, I never would have brushed my teeth. What kid in the right mind sees the history of sticking some uncomfortable thing in your mouth every day? And I mean, right, I mean, flossing is even worse. So, so thank God that our parents made us do these things because, because eventually we learned about, and, and, and I'd, I'd actually suggest church is the same sort of thing. 
And if church is valuable, and, and we're going to talk about hate and why it's, so, it's, why it's so important to address hate, actually the most effective way to address hate is early on. And so to address, to put our kids in situations where this is, where, uh, where these things are taught in no uncertain terms, I'd suggest that's very, very important. And if that is as important as brushing your teeth, and obviously I think it is, then at a certain stage in our life, we might want to even exercise this kind of power, making sure our kids are present in Faith Factory, SNL, uh, those sorts of things as well. So um, first type of power. Uh, second type of power is utility power. This is power that is exercised through providing benefits and rewards, carrots and sticks. And Stephen Covey suggested that this is really the, the way most power on the earth is used. Sometimes we do this, sometimes we have to do this. In a fallen world, sometimes this is the only way we get to where we want to go. Uh, but, but, but this is where, where most, most power happens. And this is where if you do what I want you to do, I'll provide some benefit to you. And if I do what you want to do, you want me to do, you'll provide some benefit to me so we all do what we're supposed to do and everybody gets along happily ever after. Now, uh, Stephen Covey said both these types of power, though they're how the world runs, uh, he said both of them are flawed. He said because, because they're like this. They're, if, if, this is a, if this is one uh, form of behavior, and if we, want, if we want to eradicate this form of behavior in our business, in the military, in our society, in you know, wherever it may be, if there's a form of behavior, if we want to, we, want to, we, can, we can remove that type of behavior by applying force. So if we apply enough force, we can drive that behavior down. This is where we want it to be, this is where it is. We can apply force, we can drive it down. We can also drive it down through rewarding people. If we provide enough rewards that have enough benefit, people will stop doing this, and, and that'll drive that behavior down. He said the problem is that the system is spring-loaded. That's what these oranges uh, things are, is they're springs. This system is, is, so we can drive it down through force, we can drive it down through benefits, but the problem is when force is removed or benefits are removed, as surely will be the case somewhere along the line, what happens to behavior? The springs unload and it shoots behavior right back to where it used to be and sometimes even further back. Now, um, I didn't tell people at 9.30 what the third type was. I got so caught up, I forgot to tell them this, so you guys are going to get to hear what they didn't hear. Um, and, and so he suggested there was actually a third type of behavior. And that third type of, or a third type of, uh, of power. And he said the third type of power and the third type of leadership is a type of leadership that uses it, is actually principle-centered power. So the third one was principle-centered power. And principle-centered power is driven by shared vision, by shared values. It's coming from inside. Nobody's forcing it in any way, shape, or, out, or, or any way, shape, or form. We're all joining together in a shared vision of what we think the future should be. And therefore, we're all willingly, and in fact, enthusiastically, to participating together in creating that future. And so what this system does is if you have these two things, behaviors here, and you got the springs in between, what this system does is behaviors here and wants to go here, it just eradicates the springs. And so this behavior collapses on its own accord. Nobody's forcing it, we're choosing to make that happen. And, uh, and this, um, this, is I think, in essence, what Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. What he's saying is this old way of doing things, this way that we showed in these first two pages, collapsing this, but the springs unloading, that's what we've always seen in the world. He said, but what we need is a new way of approaching life together, a new way that doesn't apply force, that doesn't apply utility, but through the use of love, through the, through, but through sharing God's love, takes the springs out all together by giving God access to people's hearts. Uh, God then changes people's hearts, and then we create this shared future together. That, I think, is what Jesus is talking about. Another person who talked about this uh, in recent times, again, who helped me a great deal in thinking about this, is Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr., in a sermon on hate, which I frankly was just tempted to read to you today, because I, I can't really do any better than that, uh, and which we will post both to our Facebook site and to our web books, uh, website so that you can read during this week. And I hope everybody will read it. You know, it'll take you 10 minutes to read, but it's, it's well worth reading. It's an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, sermon. Um, uh, but Martin Luther King, in this sermon, he, he used the image of driving down the road, and it was actually an experience that he and his brother, A.D., had. And they were driving to Chattanooga uh, one night, 
and all the oncoming traffic was, was refusing to dim, dim their light. So, so it just was, everybody had their high beams on. And you know how frustrating that can be. And so Martin Luther King's brother got frustrated, and he said, doggone it. I'm just going to put my, heights, my lights on high, and I'm just going to leave them on high, and I'm going to blind everybody. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, oh, no, you, you can't do that. Because if everybody's blind, what good does that do? He said, somebody's got to have the sense to dim their lights. And, and I, I love that analogy. I love that analogy because it says the problem in the world isn't darkness. I mean, obviously, darkness is a problem. But, but Martin Luther King, faced with all this darkness, uh, he says the, the problem is all the people who want to let their light shine. All the people think, I'm right. I've got the truth. My way is the only way. I and so it's all these people who are uh, approaching it through, you know, through letting their light shine, but lying in such a way that they just want to overpower everybody else, blind everybody else. All that does is produce a bunch of blind people, and all that will ultimately do is lead to destruction. And Martin Luther King Jr. says, actually, if you look at the history of the human race, it's the history of, of, it's the history of nations refusing to dim their lights, trying to outshine other people, and they've all come to destruction. He says, we've got to learn another way. In fact, the way he says it quite literally, he says, is we need to realize that force only begets force. That was page one. That's the spring-loaded system. That hate only begets hate. That was page one, the spring-loaded system. That toughness only begets toughness. And it creates a descending spiral that will only end in the destruction of all. Somebody, he says has to have the sense. Somebody has to have the moral conviction to dim their lights. And that's this, friends. That's this. And so what we want to say today in no uncertain terms, and we do want to say this in no uncertain terms, because I don't know that we say this often enough in, in, with, with no ambiguity, uh, is that we want to say that hating another person or hating another group of people is always wrong, flat out, categorically wrong. Meeting hate with hate, meeting violence with violence, that meeting force with force, will ultimately only keep the system going. It only creates more of the old, only keeps the old going. It might be a temporary solution, sometimes even a necessary temporary solution. But all it will do is perpetuate the system, It'll be like whack-a-mole. You, you might kill it here, but it's just going to pop up here. Because those forces, you haven't addressed the system. You've just addressed the symptoms. The system is alive and well and actually growing stronger. And, and, so, uh, and, and so we just want to say, and, and, and this is picked up in the epistle, when in the epistle Paul says, hate what is evil. And this is the only place in the whole Bible that this particular Greek word is used. Other places where the word hate is used, probably a different English word should be used. It's talking comparatively. It's not talking absolutely. This is the only place in the whole Bible this word is used. And this really does mean hate. And this word mean, and, and, and what does he say? Hate what is evil, not hate who is evil. And they go on, I hope you'll take this home and read it. Put it on your dresser, read it in the morning. Take your bulletin home, read this. He goes on to say that we need to bless those who are us, outdo one another in showing honor to everybody, and over, don't overcome evil with evil. That's page one, that's old system, but overcome evil with good. And that's what we're talking about, talking about here. And so it's always wrong to hate other people or groups of people. It's always wrong to hate a religion, whatever it may be. It's always wrong to hate another race. It's always wrong to hate people who have a particular uh, sexual preference or, uh, or gender identity. It's always wrong to hate policemen. It's always wrong to hate whoever. You feel it all. It's always wrong to hate Muslims. It's, it's always categorically wrong. The old system is only going to produce the old system. And for those who are interested, and that old system is ultimately, if we continue to choose it, going to only end in, in the destruction of all of us. And if we, if we want to choose that better way, if we want our vision to align with God's vision, if we want to create a new uh, future for humanity, uh, then we've got to choose to love instead. Let me finish this up with uh, one quick example of this. Um, 
and then we're done. Uh, I recently I was talking with a, a woman, professional woman. Uh, she had actually taken my history, so she knew I was a priest. Uh, I don't generally tell people that in conversations because that is a way of shaping conversations. But um, as our conversation went on, as all my conversations do if I have enough time uh, and if it's appropriate, uh, I said, so are you a person of faith? And she said to me, uh, well, no. Oh, she said, yes, I am. That's what she said, yes, I am. Uh, but since she knew I was a priest, she said, but I don't go to church anymore. And I said, okay, well, that, fair enough. I mean, I know lots of people like that. I said, uh, but I'd be really interested if you're comfortable telling me. If you're not, that's okay. This is going to be the end of this conversation. But, but if you're comfortable telling me, I, I'd love to know why I don't go to church anymore. And she said, oh, I'd be happy to tell you. Uh, she said, um, the church I grew up in only cared about rules. Some of you grew up in that church as well. She said, the church I grew up only cared about rules. And she said, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, it, 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 it defined that group like a club, and, you know, they were a club like any other club. And, and, and she really had no animosity. She said, you know, the church just only cared about rules. And she said, but you know what? I got divorced. And so those rules really left no room for me. And so I just don't really see the place in my life for church anymore. And I said, well, you know, you might be surprised, but that actually makes a lot of sense to me. I actually understand that. Uh, and, and you're not the only one who feels that way. I mean, there, there's lots of people who feel that way. And I said, you might not want to hear this. And I'm, I'm pushing, you know, I know I'm pushing a little bit, so please forgive me. Uh, I said, but would you like to hear what I, how I understand church? You know, if you don't, that's okay. Um, and I know I'm being a little pushy. And she said, no, I, sure, tell me. Tell me how you understand church. And uh, to understand what I said here, you, you need to see a picture. So we have a, we have a picture here. You may recognize these as my daughters. These, these, are, these are my daughters. That's, uh, that's Mary on the left, who is there graduating from college, and Christine on, on the right. And I said, you know, I'm a father. I have two girls, and uh, Christine and Mary. And I, and I said, uh, you know, here's a simple truth. If anybody, anybody hurts my girls, If anybody mistreats my daughters and, and, and doesn't make that right somewhere along the line, if they continue to do it, if they don't in some way, if it, we are never, ever, ever going to be okay. Hands down, categorically, end of story. I mean, and, 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 I, and I said, the way I understand it, I don't think God cares a whole lot about rules. I think God cares about God's kids. And the way I see it, the only reason for a church to exist is if it helps us treat one another better. And so that's why I go to church. That's why church is so important to me. Because I need a lot of help in treating people well. I need a lot of help in turning my back on hatefulness. I need a lot of help in turning my back and being tough and learning to be tender instead. I need a lot of help, and that's why I go to church. That's why church exists. That's what church is all about, is God saying, you know what? You can do, you can, you can sing, you know, you can recite liturgy till you're blue in the face. You can sing hymns at the top of your lungs. You can put a million dollars in the offering plate, but you mistreat my children. We are never, ever ever going to be okay. So the way we get right with God is we get right with each other. Martin Luther King Jr. concludes his sermon by saying, Jesus walked the hill of Palestine and he saw Rome and all its glory and all its terror. And he looked at Rome and he said, I refuse to use that method. Rome with all its resources, Jesus with all the resources of heaven, which made the resources of Rome pale in comparison. I refuse to use that method to use the world. He said to Rome, I love you. And I would rather die than hate you. And Jesus did. And Martin Luther King Jr. looked at the world and all the people who were so hurting him and hurting his people and he was so tempted to use the same methods back that they used with him. And he said, following his Lord Jesus, I will not use that method. He said this quite literally. 
He said, I love you, and I would rather die than hate you. He did. But those two people, Jesus the Christ and Martin Luther King Jr., have changed the world like nobody before or after them ever has. So my prayer this morning is that we would be equally committed to standing against hate and standing for love. That we too would be equally dedicated to treating God's children right. That we too would say, I'm not gonna choose the methods of this world. I would, I love you, absolutely everybody. Even those people it is so hard, and especially those people it's hard to say to, I love you, and I would rather die than mistreat or hate you. Amen. Amen.